In this lessons episode, discover why whole plant foods are the foundation of both long-term health and effective weight loss. Learn how real food supports sustainable habits better than trendy diets. Learn why legumes and whole grains are superior to low-carb alternatives. And learn how a mostly plant-based approach can still allow for small amounts of lean meat without harming your health. So when you look at all the different diets that people take on because they'll take on uh, like a, to, to lose weight. Somebody's focused on, on health and wellness. They want to go and lose weight. And then obviously let's, let's hope they add the gym or some sort of physical activity into that mix. But then there's, there's keto, there's paleo, there's um, I guess more of a traditional food pyramid where you have lower fats, moderate proteins, uh, moderate carbs. Like you have all these different diets. I'm sure there's others that I, I have never tried or can't think of right now. But you're saying that the best possible diet for overall health, and I would assume there's a way to combine that into weight loss as well, because that is a huge contributor to health and wellness if you're, if you're obese and you have to lose a little bit of weight, um, would be whole foods. You, you mentioned whole foods take priority over like even proteins, which are meats, excuse me, which is interesting. Um, so if you could help somebody just understand not just why nutrient dense foods are good for longevity, but why nutrient dense foods are a key piece of, a, for example, like a weight loss diet or somebody trying to get back on track. How does that, how does that play into it? Cause I think that the whole Ozempic craze, uh, and the thing that is the most urgent, important in people's minds is how do I look better, a little bit better, and how do I fit into a, a slightly smaller size of, of clothing, regardless of whether or not that should be their main priority, because I think longevity is a pretty damn good priority as well. That's the reality that people deal with. That's why people jump on these fad diets. Yeah, diets don't work by definition, because going on a diet implies at some point you're going to be going off a diet, right? Permanent weight loss requires permanent dietary change. Healthier habits just have to become a way of life. And so if they're going to be lifelong, you want them to lead to a long life. Um, you know, the goal of weight loss is not to fit into a skinnier casket, right? Um, uh, thankfully, the good news is, is that the single best diet proven for weight loss just so happens to be the safest, cheapest way to eat for the longest, healthiest life. And that is a whole food plant-based diet shown in the broad study um, to be the single most effective weight loss diet ever published in the peer-reviewed medical literature that didn't restrict portions. Um, ever. So the most effective diet also happens to be the healthiest diet when it comes to longevity. This is the diet um, that every single blue zone centers their, um, uh, uh, their diets on. There's been over 150 dietary surveys in the world's longest living populations. I mean, they all um, center their diets around these whole plant foods, eating about 95% uh, plant-based and centering the primary um, protein source as uh, one of the legumes, beans, chickpeas, chickpeas, or lentils. And that's, so when you look at all the different diets out there, I know that you don't like low-carb diets or no-carb diets. I know that that's something that you don't subscribe to. So if you look at the ratios of legumes, that's the majority of your diet. How do you think about the other pieces? What are the, the healthier carbs or, I mean, carbs and from legumes as well, but the healthier carbs and the healthier proteins, like, are you including rice? Are you including potatoes? I guess sweet potato. Are you including any kind of meat at all? And if so, what meat would be the best to fit into that perfect ideal diet? Yeah, no, no. I'm so glad it really has to be like, uh, you know, the, the food industry, the processed food industry loves talking about macros. Why? Because they can make you any kind of junk food you want. You want low-fat junk food? Boom, snack well cookies. You want low-carb junk food? Boom, we got that. You want, ironically, paleo junk food? Oh, we'll give you that too, right? Um, the one kind of junk they can't make is real food, right? They just can't make money off of it. So they don't, they don't want you to talk about foods. They want you to talk about macronutrients because, oh, oh, oh they want you to talk about nutrients, right? That's why Fruit Loops has 13 fruit, uh, vitamins and minerals, right? Right on the cover, right? Is it, right? Um, as if, you know, eating marshmallows for breakfast is the way to get your, uh, the only way to get your, you know, 13 vitamins and minerals. Um, but, okay, so it's not, so look, I mean, you know, uh, you know, carbohydrates can mean kidney beans or jelly beans, right? I mean, you know, you can't just talk about are carbs good or bad, right? Protein could be, you know, pork rinds or, you know, could be, you know, uh, you know, fats could be, you know, you know, Crisco, trans fats, 
or a walnuts or something, right? Um, and so we have to talk about food, right? That's what we eat. We don't eat nutrients, we eat food. Okay, so when we talk about foods, the healthiest sources of protein are legumes, but uh, also whole grains, nuts, and seeds can contribute. We're looking at 0.8 grams per healthy kilogram body weight, which is the official recommendation of the National Academy of Science. Um, in terms of carbohydrates, the healthiest, car again, whole plant foods are the healthiest source of all three classes of macronutrients. Where are we going to get our fats? Um, from Ideally, from, uh, mostly from nuts and seeds. Where are we going to get our carbohydrates from? We are going to get them uh, from, uh, you know, uh, from, you know, whole grains, sweet potatoes would be great. White potatoes would not be a good source. No. Um, oh. uh, uh, as the, one of the few whole plant foods actually associated with increased risk of of disease, including diabetes, and stay away from the refined grains like white rice, etc. Um, uh, and so that's and now in terms of um, in terms of meat, right? We should really try to eat primarily plants, but not necessarily exclusively plants, right? A plant-based diet is really just about maximizing the intake of the healthiest foods, right? As a physician, you know these labels like vegetarian or vegan. That just tells me what you don't eat. I mean, do you actually eat vegetables, right? Um, and of course, it doesn't matter what you eat on your birthdays, holidays, special occasions, right? It's the day-to-day -day stuff that adds up. On a day-to-day -day basis, we really um, should try to be healthy, centering our diets around natural foods. The, um, the best meats would be a wild, wild game. Um, so venison in Australia, kangaroo. Um, so extraordinarily lean, right? Like, you know, moose, elk, like 4% calories from fat. Um, so, and why we care about fat calories is because we care about saturated animal fat, um, raising our LDL cholesterol is a primary risk factor for a number one killer of men and women, heart disease. Um, but 4%, in fact, chicken used to be only 2% fat 100 years ago, according to the USDA. Now it's over 20% fat. We've selectively bred these animals to be extra juicy. Um, and how do we make them? You know, we marble the fle their flesh with the saturated fat. That's why, so for example, grass-fed beef, a significantly less saturated fat um, than grain-fed uh, cattle. Um, and so, uh, so it would be kind of the leaner the better um, uh, would be the way to go. Um, and there's just nothing even comes close to the leanness of, uh, of, of game. And, of course, it would be caught with um, uh, lead-free ammunition if you're uh, doing it on your own. Wow, okay, amazing. And I think that that even is, that's so telling that even chicken that everybody assumes is the healthiest. There's more calories from fat than protein in chicken these days. I mean, it's just absolutely extraordinary. Wow. In fact, in fact to our the food. beef industry it's loves all, it's all money. Needed. Yeah, well, you can do studies now where you can randomize people to eat beef versus chicken and see no difference in cholesterol. Where the whole sentence is, oh, get rid of red meat, go over to, you know, white meat. No, because you can get a leaner cut of beef than you can actually get, you know, eating, uh, you know, eating a thigh or something. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, if you can find it, um, uh, the, you know, something like uh, grass-fed beef uh, is probably, probably the easiest um, kind of... It's not. I mean, that's not close to wild caught game, but in terms of you know what you can find out there, not everybody's going out with lead free uh, uh, ammunition and, and hunting their own thing. They're just trying to. Although out. there's farmed, there's farmed venison. Yeah, I mean, so they actually, you know, I mean, you, you should. I don't know. You could probably buy it online. I don't know. But the point is, the point is, you have to you have to learn and you have to do your own research because the things that are marketed to us as healthy are definitely not always healthy. I'm very curious. Because you've written both How Not to Die and How to Age. Uh, how not, sorry, How Not to Die and How Not to Age, excuse me. Not How to Age, How Not to Age. When you compare those two ideas, what to you is the difference between not dying and not aging? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So um, if you do uh, uh, autopsies of centenarians, those that lived over be 100, uh, this is, this is a, um, a survey of 13,000 autopsies. In every single case, Death was from disease. Even though they appeared perfectly healthy before dying, their doctors were like, oh, clean bill of health. If you actually cut them open, every single one died from disease. And most commonly heart disease, which is the number one killer of those, you know, younger than that. Um, uh, and so if death is from disease, then, you know, why wasn't my book, you know, How Not to Die, all you, you know, all you need as an anti-aging book? Because it was the first half of the book is just 15 chapters, each of the 15 leading causes of death, talking about the role of diet may play in preventing, reversing, reversing each of our top 15 killers. And so it's like, well, then, I mean, if you check off the boxes, what's the problem? Well, it turns out um, that, I mean, the single greatest risk factor for mo many of these diseases is actually aging such that even if 
all cancer were cured overnight, we would only increase average lifespan by about three years. Why? Because if one age-related disease doesn't kill you, another one will. The only reason you died from cancer, you didn't die from a heart attack, is because you died from cancer first, but you were going to die in our next month from a heart attack anyway. And so, um, yes, you know, having high cholesterol can increase your risk of uh, having a heart attack as much as 20-fold, but um, you know, an 80-year-old has 500 times the risk as an 18-year-old um, in terms of heart disease. And because aging affects so many different diseases, if we slow down the aging process, then you can, instead of playing whack-a-mole, which each individual disease, um, you can reduce your risk of kind of age-related diseases across the board, which are many of our leading killers. So when you see, when you, it's sort of all, all of your work and all the teaching is really just like you're eating whole foods, uh, you're, you're trying to slow down your aging, you shouldn't have the food contributing to you dying quicker, God forbid. But when you look at people like, for example, Brian Johnson, who's doing everything under the sun to reverse aging, aging what percentage of all the stuff that he does actually slows down aging versus if you just ate a whole food diet? Well, so one thing he does is eat a plant-based diet. And so, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that's actually evidence-based. Um, and then he just tries all sorts of crazy crap that doesn't have any, you know, evidence-based and look good for him, right? I mean, you know, uh, I mean, uh, it's kind of interesting experimental data kind of as, as a guinea pig. I certainly wouldn't do half the things. Um, I, someone just told me he just did plasmapheresis. We basically like remove all the liquid portion of your blood and like replace with like, you know, albumin water or something. I was just like, that is like nutty. I mean, that's what you do when people are like dying from some like horrible, you know, yeah, poison. Yeah, I, I think I saw that on his Instagram. It was absolutely wild. Absolutely amazing. I mean, it, that, yeah, that's how we would do that voluntarily, but it's like, you know, he's like doing it for science, God damn it. And okay, I just, I just don't want people to go out there and necessarily follow in those footsteps until we can actually prove something is useful. But no, he is doing some things that are just, you know, that really are consistent with the longevity of literature. He just kind of takes it an extra step too far, kind of beyond, um, uh, beyond the evidence base. But you know, that's how we learn new things is we kind of go beyond the evidence base and kind of try things out. Thanks for tuning in. If you found this valuable, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you want to dive deeper into this conversation, check out the links in the description to watch the full episode. See you in the next one.